Integrity. It's the quality of being consistently honest and continually upright. Integrity also refers to the steadfast adherence to a strict moral or ethical code. And listen, integrity in the life of a Christian is so important that one Bible commentator once insisted that our integrity and godly behavior in an unbelieving world will make others long to know the Lord. What this means is that the testimony of every Christian is directly affected by our personal integrity. And therefore, the Christian who allows a lack of integrity to to diminish their testimony, they're going to become less effective in leading others to a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, in order to further grasp the connection between our personal integrity and our Christian testimony... Let's consider the way that a believer's testimony about Jesus is automatically diminished the very minute their integrity is weighed and found wanting. For example, consider the sad story of a Houston pastor named Charles Guilford. Pastor Guilford actually stole over $400,000 from his unsuspecting congregation. You see, Pastor Guilford and his wife enjoyed taking trips to Louisiana to go gambling. They stole this $400,000 over a period of time, and they took this money and used it for gambling trips to the Cochetta Casino near Lake Charles in Louisiana. Listen, not only were these church leaders charged with aggregate theft and the misapplication of fiduciary property, but they also allowed their lack of integrity to destroy their Christian testimony, not only with the people of their congregation, but also with everyone else who has heard the story. Now, it's true that the church has seen a myriad of ministers mishandling money, but it's also true that the testimonies of many church leaders have been destroyed by a lack of marital integrity. For example, in 1991, Pastor Jimmy Swaggart was found in the company of a prostitute a second time. And in 2006, Pastor Ted Haggard was caught cheating on his wife with a 20-year-old man. In light of these sexual scandals, we must agree that the Christian who fails to be true to their marriage vows has also allowed a lack of integrity to destroy their Christian testimony in the eyes of others. Well, here in our study today, we're going to consider the importance creating a Christian testimony which is based upon the personal integrity of consistent honesty and upright morality. And as we dig into our text today, James is going to help us to understand, number one, that the integrity of our testimony is based upon our credibility. Secondly, this morning, we'll learn that the integrity of our testimony is based upon our honesty. And third, <clears throat> thirdly, and finally today, we'll learn that the integrity of our testimony is based upon our fidelity. Well, with this as our outline, let's open our Bibles to James chapter 5 because there we find James, he's encouraging his audience to become men and women of personal integrity. Now, as you make your way to James chapter 5, I want to set the stage for our study today. And I want to do so by reminding you that James was a Christian leader who was concerned about the integrity of every believer. And it was for this reason that James encouraged these Christians in the third chapter of this epistle to control their mouths, to control what they were saying. The reason why is because according to James, the tongue is a fire and a world of iniquity. And with it, we can speak the truth, but at the same time, we can use our mouth to speak lies. That being the case, here in our text today, we find James, he's continuing to build upon this principle by encouraging every believer to walk in their integrity by speaking the truth with one another. But this is our focus. Let's take a look at our text today. If you would look with me there at James chapter 5, I'd like to look at verse 12 because there James declares, but above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. 
Now here in this verse, and here in our text today, we find James, he's encouraging his audience to stop making empty promises and instead to simply say what they meant and to mean what they say. Based on this, we're going to spend our time today examining the importance of personal integrity. And as we do, we should begin by first taking a moment to consider the level of importance that James gave to this policy of honesty that leads to integrity. You see, according to James, our integrity is one of the most important virtues that a disciple can demonstrate. In order to prove my point, look with me again there at verse 12. There James declares, but above all, my brethren. Now let's just stop right there because it'll help us to understand that the phrase above all, it could also be translated, but most of all, or it could also be rendered before all things. It's for this reason that Robert Young's literal translation presents 12, uh, verse 12 like this, and before all things. He's saying, before all things, my brethren, do not swear neither by the heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, and let your yes be yes, and the no, no, that under judgment ye may not fall. So he's saying, before all things, before everything, above everything, stop swearing. Stop making empty promises. And from this we can see that James was intending to help his Christian audience to grasp the importance of making integrity a top priority of our relationships with one another. What this means is that the Christian who fails to first commit themselves to a life of honest integrity will also fail to accomplish every other encouragement that James presented here in this epistle. You can set out to accomplish everything else in this letter, and yet if you have no integrity, then no one's going to believe a word you say. You can say that you're going to try to accomplish everything that James has written, but in so saying, if you have no credibility and if you have no integrity, no one will believe you. Therefore, James was encouraging his audience to make honesty their first policy by saying, hey, above everything else, before all things, stop making these empty promises. It's in this way that Christians can build our relationships upon truth and trust. To further prove my point, notice with me again there at verse 12. There James declares, but above all, my brethren, do not swear. Now let's just stop right there because it's, 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 it's interesting to note here that this word swear, it was translated from a Greek word which was used to refer to a courtroom witness who was swearing to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Not only that, but this word was also used by the Jews there in the first century in reference to the promises that they would swear in the name of God. And so they would make a promise and they would say, I promise and I swear this promise in the name of God or by the, by the throne in heaven. I swear this promise. I should also point out that it wasn't uncommon for the Jewish people in this time period to make a promise and then turn around and break that promise. As a result, these people, they would swear their promises by the things in heaven. They would do this in order to bolster their credibility in the eyes of others. They were so used to having promises broken that they felt like, well, in order to really sound like, I, like I'm making this promise, I'll swear by the things in heaven. And then I'll sound credible. It's sad to say that not much has changed since then. As a matter of fact, I'm sure we all know people here in the 21st century who attempt to convince us of their credibility by swearing to God or by swearing on a stack of Bibles. Do you promise? I promise. I'll swear on a stack of Bibles. Bring me that stack of Bibles over here. And yet the fact is, a person of true integrity, a person who has credibility, they feel no need to swear on a stack of Bibles. They feel no need to bring God into their promise. Because they mean what they say, and they say what they mean. Think about it. The only reason that people feel the need to swear their promises by God, well, it must be due to the fact that 
Well, they already know in and of themselves that they've already broken so many promises to so many people that they're pretty sure that nobody believes them. And seeing how these promise breakers, they're lacking personal integrity, they must bolster their credibility by swearing promises to God. So these promise breakers, they're quick to say, I swear to God that I'm going to do this. That being the case, James seems to have known that this was common practice there with those first century Jews, and it's for this reason that he encouraged them to stop swearing by heaven. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 12. <clears throat> there James declares, But above all, my brethren, do not swear by heaven. Now it's interesting to note that the word heaven in this context, it refers to the eternal dimensions in which the throne of God is found. For example, in the 103rd Psalm, King David declared, the Lord has established his throne in heaven. In Isaiah 66, the Lord declares, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. From this, it should be obvious to us that James was writing about the place where God's throne is located. And he's saying, hey, quit swearing by heaven because this is the throne of God. And listen, not only was James directing every believer to stop swearing by the things in heaven, but he also encouraged Christians to stop swearing by the things on this earth. This is our focus. Look again there at verse 12. There James declares, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth. From this we can see that it's not only wrong to swear our promises to God and to, to, to the throne of God or to the things in heavenly places, but it's also wrong to swear upon the natural things found here on this earth. For example, we shouldn't swear upon our children's lives. We certainly shouldn't swear upon the, 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 the grave of a dead relative. And yet people constantly are swearing by the things of this earth. Now, in order to understand why it's wrong to swear promises in this way, if you would hold your place here in the book of James and turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. <laughs> As you make your way to Matthew 23, I want to take a moment to consider the importance of creating true credibility so that we no longer have to swear by the things of heaven or by the things of earth. It'll first help us to understand that credibility refers to the quality of being believable and trusted. Not only that, but credibility, it refers to a person's reliability, it refers to their dependability, especially as, as it pertains to our word. That being the case, the person who has no problem breaking some of their promises some of the time, they're simultaneously destroying their own credibility. When a person chooses to make promises but then break some of them, every broken promise is slowly destroying their credibility. As a result, these people who break promises, they're also ruining their integrity as they chip away at their credibility. This is precisely why Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of the first century. You see, they thought that they could keep some promises and it was okay to break others. No big deal. Jesus had a different opinion. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at Matthew 23, I'd like to begin reading at verse 16. There Jesus declares... Woe to you, blind guides, who say, whoever swears by the temple, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, it is nothing. But whoever swears by the gift that is on it, he is obliged to perform it. Fools and blind. For which is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it and by all things on it. He who swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God and by him who sits on it. Now here in these verses we find Jesus. He's dealing with those religious leaders of the first century who were actually teaching the people that some promises were okay to break. If you made a promise of this nature, then, you know, you, if you kept it or not, you know, it's, it's nothing. 
But if you swore in this way, and if you swore on these things, then you had to keep that promise. So according to them and according to these first century teachings, some promises were obligatory and some promises weren't. Some promises you had to keep, some promises you didn't. Some promises were binding, others not so much. While this was common for the children of Israel to think this way, they're in the first century. Jesus came along and reminded them that every promise is equally binding in the eyes of God. Now, in order to understand where Jesus was coming up with this crazy concept, if you would hold your place here in the book of James and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 23. You see, it's in Deuteronomy 23 where we find the Lord. He's challenging the Israelites about the importance of keeping every promise that they made. And with this as our focus, if you would look with me there at Deuteronomy chapter 23. I'd like to begin reading at verse 21. There in Deuteronomy 23, 21, Moses declares, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. But if you abstain from vowing, it shall not be sin to you. That which has gone from your lips you shall keep and perform. For you voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised with your mouth. Now here in these verses we learn that while the Jews weren't required to make any promises to God, they were in fact required to keep the promises that they made. If they made a promise to God, God was going to require it of them. This was regardless of whether they swore by heaven or earth or by the temple or by the gold in the temple. Regardless of what they swore upon, if they made a promise to God, God was going to require it of them. From this, we can see why Jesus was rebuking those blind, foolish guides who seemed to think that some promises were binding while others were breakable. According to Jesus, this wasn't the case at all. See, the Lord hears our promises. And he requires those promises of us. And listen, that being the case, I believe that every believer would do well to live according to this same principle. We ought to keep the promises that we make, and not only because the Lord expects us to keep our promises, but also because the integrity of our Christian testimony is largely based upon our credibility. And our Christian credibility is largely based upon our honesty, which is then demonstrated by our desire to keep the promises that we make. That being the case, it would be better for us to stop making promises altogether than to make a bunch of empty promises, only to then keep some of them and break the rest. We would do better to make no promises than to break some of the promises that we make. You see, every time we break a promise, we chip away at our credibility. And every time we chip away at our credibility, we're ruining our testimony. From this we see then that the integrity of our testimony is based upon our personal credibility. But not only that, the integrity of our testimony is also based upon our honesty. Now with this is our focus, let's turn back to James chapter 5 because there we find James, he's encouraging his audience to continue establishing their integrity through honesty. If you would look with me there at verse 12 again. There James declares... But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or, he says, with any other oath. Now here in this verse, we not only find James encouraging these Christians to stop swearing promises by heaven and earth, but we also find James instructing them to stop making promises with any other sort of oath. Now this word oath, it's translated from a Greek word which refers to that which has been pledged or promised, the solemn vow. And so James was basically telling these believers here to stop making these oaths, stop making these solemn vows that they might not be able to keep. 
in order to more fully grasp James' point of view here, I'd like to back up and consider some of the context of this passage. If you would, let's go back to James chapter 4. Because there in James 4, we find him reminding his audience that they really didn't have a clue about the future. This is our focus. Look with me there at James 4, beginning at verse 13. There James declares, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Now, here in these verses that we've already studied, we're reminded of the fact that James was wanting these Christians to understand that all of their future plans were limited by the fact that they really didn't have a clue about tomorrow. And so we can make all sorts of future plans But the reality comes when tomorrow arrives and we discover that it was nothing like we intended it to be. What do you know about tomorrow? Not a whole lot. Therefore, not only does this affect our business plans about the future, but it also applies to the promises that we make today. You see, we make all kinds of promises about tomorrow and yet we're clueless about tomorrow. We make all sorts of promises about the future and what we're intending to do, and yet, what do we know about the future? That being the case, before we make a solemn promise to any person, we must make sure to remember that we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Therefore, what sort of oaths can we take today? Now, to further explain the point that I'm trying to make, I'd like to continue to consider the importance of integrity by avoiding the dishonesty of broken promises. And in order to do so, if you would, continue holding your place there in the book of James and turn with me back to the Gospel of Matthew. I'd like you to to turn to Matthew chapter 5. And as you make your way back to Matthew, I want to remind you about the definition of integrity. I want to remind you, as I pointed out in the introduction of this study, that integrity is a word that refers to the quality of being consistently honest. Therefore, the person who makes an oath of any kind, the person who makes a solemn vow of any kind, and then ends up breaking that oath or or ends up breaking that solemn vow because of unforeseen circumstances well, they're still simultaneously damaging their integrity. It's for this reason that Jesus challenged those Jews there in the first century who were quick to swear an oath. He challenged them to make sure that they weren't damaging their own integrity with the promises that they made. With this in mind, look with me there at Matthew chapter 5. I'd like to begin reading at verse 33 because there Jesus declares... Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Now here in these verses we find Jesus. He's reminding his disciples that they couldn't control the color of their hair. He's saying, hey, you can't even make one hair white if you want it white. Or you can't make it black if you want it black. You have no control over this. And, you know, that's no longer true in our day and age. We have dyes and stuff like that that we can use. Franco himself uses Grecian formula for men. And he assured me earlier that he can make his white hairs black. So let's not be confused about what we're talking about. Jesus here is saying, hey, look, you can't control the color of your hair. So how is it that you can make these promises about tomorrow? How could you guarantee the fulfillment of an oath if you can't even alter the the color of one of your hairs? 
And listen, according to Jesus, since we don't really know what tomorrow brings, wouldn't it be better for us to maintain our integrity by simply being true to our word rather than making all these elaborate oaths and all these promises only to then ruin our testimony by breaking the oaths that we made? So he says, hey, let your yes be yes. And don't swear more than that. Now, this brings us to our third point, because listen, the integrity of our testimony is not only based upon our personal credibility, and the integrity of our testimony is not only based upon our honesty, but the integrity of our testimony is also based upon our fidelity. And with this is our focus, let's make our way back to James chapter 5, because there we find James, he's encouraging his audience to continue establishing their integrity through fidelity. You would look with me again there at verse 12. There James again declares, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but, he says, let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Now here in these verses, or here in, the, here in this verse, I, I, I should say, James is encouraging his audience to let their yes be yes. In other words, if you say yes, let it be a yes. Don't say yes and then turn around and then say no. Likewise, he's saying let your no be a no. Don't say no and then turn around and say yes. Now, there's no doubt in my mind here that James is actually quoting the encouragement that Jesus was presenting to his disciples back in Matthew chapter 5. To, to further consider what this means here, I'd like to consider the way the, the scholars of the New Living Translation rendered this verse. They put it like this. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. More simply put, if you say yes, then let it remain a yes. If you say no, then you better mean no. Clearly, both James and Jesus, they were concerned about the fidelity of every believer's word. And in order to explain what I mean by that, it'll help you to understand that the word fidelity in this context, it refers to a, person, a person's adherence to truth. It refers to their strict observance to the promises they make. Fidelity refers to the person who says, I made a promise, and I'm going to do everything I can to keep that promise. Therefore, when James encouraged these believers to let their yes be yes, he was simply telling them to adhere themselves to the word that they spoke. Likewise, if their answer is no, then according to James, they should maintain their word with all fidelity. Now, one reason why the fidelity of every believer is so important is due to the fact that the believer who says one thing but then does another, they could possibly find themselves on the receiving end of legal condemnation. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at the end of verse 12. There James instructs his audience by declaring, let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. In other words, James was saying, look, all you need to say is a simple yes or no. You don't need to enter into these contracts. You don't need to enter into these oaths. Otherwise, you might end up condemned. Now, in order to better understand the condemnation that James is writing about here, if you would hold your pla place here in the book of James and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, as you make your way to 1 Corinthians 6, I should point out that there are many promises which are actually contractual and therefore legally binding. And listen, the Christian who decides to enter into a legally binding contract, they should be prepared to keep their side of the contract. If they said, yes, I'm signing my name on this dotted line, and I'm going to pay this bill off in this amount of time, you better let your yes be a yes. Otherwise, you might receive legal condemnation. You see, the believer who breaks a legally binding contract is the disciple who ends up damaging their testimony in the eyes of the world because they soon find themselves facing the judicial condemnation of a secular court. This is one thing that Paul was warning the Christians in Corinth about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you would look with me beginning there at verse 1, there Paul declares, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? 
Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Now here in these verses we find Paul, he's rebuking the Christians there in Corinth for cheating other believers there within their fellowship. These Christians were cheating one another. They were making promises, they were entering into contracts, and, and they were breaking their promises, and they were breaking their contracts. They were cheating one another, and this word cheat, found there in verse 8, It was used to describe the person who ended up defrauding another person by robbing them of that which was promised. And so they made these promises to one another, but then they would cheat one another. Listen, not only were these believers defrauding one another, they're within their church with these broken promises, but they were also destroying the testimony of Christ's church by taking their legal issues that were happening within their fellowship, they were taking them to the, to the legal courts. They weren't settling their case within their church. No, they were going to courts. And then as the courts looked on, they saw, oh, this is how Christians treat one another. They make promises to one another, and then they break promises to one another, and they can't even handle it themselves, so they, they have to come to the courts. According to Paul, these Christians would have done better to simply accept the wrong that was done to them rather than to destroy their testimony within the courts. It's for this reason that he asked, why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Why would you give Christ a black eye by taking this matter to a secular court? Well, when we think about this, we see here that Paul was ready to rebuke these believers for destroying their testimonies with broken promises to one another. Saying, hey, you shouldn't be treating one another like this. You shouldn't be cheating other believers there within your fellowship. So that was deserving of rebuke. But how much more of a rebuke should a Christian receive for cheating an unbeliever? How much more of a rebuke should a believer receive if we defraud an unbeliever and damage our Christian testimony in the eyes of an unbeliever? Christian, listen, the people of God should be concerned with the fidelity of our word and not just here within our fellowship, but in the way that we interact with the world. And listen, not only because we want to avoid the condemnation that might come from a secular court, but because we should be concerned with the way that we represent our Savior. We should be concerned about our testimony and how unbelievers see us. Now, in order to further prove my point, if you would turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, because there Paul helps us to see how our testimony of Jesus will be reflected by our fidelity or by our lack of integrity. You see, it's in 2 Corinthians 1 where we find Paul. He's writing about his own decision-making process. And he was helping the Christians in Corinth to understand that he wanted to be a Christian who was true to his word. And the reason why is because Jesus is true to his word. Now, what this is our focus, if you would look with me there at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I'd like to begin reading at verse 17. There Paul declares, Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? 
But as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among, uh, among you by us, by me, Sylvanius, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now, here in these verses, Paul was reminding his audience that the promises of God that are found in Jesus are yes. And I'm here to tell you that this is good news. Because think about it. What if Jesus lacked the fidelity needed to always be true to his word? And you come to a point in your life where you recognize that you need his gracious gift of forgiveness. And you come to him and you, you cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. Can I have your grace? And, and on that day, he says, yes, you can have my grace. And then life begins to happen to you as a believer. And you see yourself struggling with sin. And you go back and you say, oh, Lord, thank you so much that your grace has covered these struggles of mine. And Jesus says, well, I was thinking about that. And I know I said yes back then, but now I'm not so sure about that. Today it's no. That would be horrible. Our life would be a roller coaster, always wondering, is Jesus going to be true to his promise? Is his yes eventually going to become a no? No, the promises of God that are found in Jesus Christ are yes and amen. What this means is that the promise of salvation is yes to those who trust in Jesus. And we can rejoice in knowing that the Lord will always be true to his word. What that means is that we can honestly rest in the promise of God. Well, knowing that Christians have been called to represent the character of God, Paul understood the importance of walking in personal integrity. It's for, for this reason that he set out to properly represent the fidelity of Jesus by being true to his word. He didn't treat his decisions lightly. He didn't just give a quick yes and then, well, tomorrow it's no because I just rushed the decision and didn't really think it through. No, he prayerfully made his plans so that if he said yes, that it could be a yes. Because that's the way our Lord is. From this, we should grasp the importance of becoming believers who are faithful to our word. You see, the Christian who answers yes one minute and then no the next, they're failing to walk in the personal integrity which is based upon fidelity. And with that being the case, we should make sure that our yes is yes. And if it's a no, then it should remain a no. In this way, we can avoid the condemnation that might come to us from, say, like a secular court. But listen, this condemnation, it can also happen in our own homes because how many kids grow up rejecting Jesus Christ because mom and dad were constantly saying yes and no, yes and no, and who could know? What kind of testimony about Jesus do we present to our kids when we say yes one minute and then it's no and then it's no and then it's yes and parents be careful because your kids might be condemning you simply because your yes isn't always a yes and your no isn't always a no Let's make sure that our yes is a yes and our no is a no. Don't treat decisions lightly. If you don't know, pray. Ask the Lord to help you. Is this a yes or is this a no? Because it would be better to give no answer at all than to destroy our testimony with a lack of integrity. And listen, not only is our integrity important for leading others into the love of Jesus, but our integrity is also important for creating righteous connections here within our church. And with this is our focus, if you would, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. And as you turn to Ephesians 4, we should take a moment to consider the, the way that a lack of integrity can damage the testimony of an entire Christian fellowship. 
That's right, the, the lack of integrity here within our own church could damage our fellowship here at Calvary South Austin. You see, if Christians are failing to fellowship together with the personal integrity of credibility and honesty and fidelity, then our church will certainly begin to suffer from the fragmented divisions that occur whenever we begin to feel like we can't trust the people that we go to church with. Yeah, these people over here, they tell me yes one minute and then no the next. Yeah, they say one thing and then they mean another. Yeah, they swear one promise, but then they're quick to break it. If this is what our relationships are like here within our church, then we're damaging the testimony of this fellowship. Then it's only a matter of time until this lack of integrity begins to split this fellowship and begins to destroy this body of believers. It's for this reason that Paul encouraged the Christians at the church in Ephesus to not only spend time learning the truths of God's word, but then to also speak truth with one another. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at Ephesians chapter 4, I'd like to begin reading at verse 11. There Paul declares that he himself, speaking of God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love now here in these verses we find Paul he's encouraging these Ephesian Christians to become this unified fellowship of believers He's wanting them to experience the unity of the faith which is found in the knowledge of the Son of God until we become this perfect man, referring to the church. That being the case, Paul's actually encouraging these Christians to focus their lives on the truths that are found in God's word by following the teachings that were written down by the prophets and the apostles, that being the word of God, delivered by the evangelists and then taught by the pastor teachers that God has raised up. He's saying, hey, you need to be in this fellowship where the word of God is being taught so that you know the truth of God's word. And would it be to God that every Christian would choose a church based on the word of God being taught? It's sad to say that the common trend is that people choose a church because the band is really awesome. I'm glad that we have an awesome band, but listen. If your band is awesome and the word of God is not being taught, it's the wrong church. The church is a place where God's word should be taught. That we take the Bible, which was written by the apostles and the prophets, and should be delivered by the pastor teacher that God has gifted. Therefore, Christians should choose a church based on a pastor of integrity who is teaching line by line and verse by verse. This is what enables the unity of the faith. Our unity must be based on the truth of God's word. And not only is the unity of a church built upon the foundation of God's word, but listen, our unity is also based upon the integrity that, that is enjoyed within a Christian fellowship where believers begin to speak the truth in love. That's why Paul tells these believers there at the church in Ephesus to speak the truth in love so that we can grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. 
And one way that this is accomplished is when we come together and when we counsel one another that we're making sure that what we're saying comes from the word of God and not just because we had this gut feeling of this is how it feels and this is what we're going to say then. No, but that we're leading people to the truths that are found in God's word and speaking the truth in love. But not only that, listen, it also means that we're speaking the truth in love. That when we make a promise, we keep that promise. That when we give our word, we mean it. That when we say yes, it's a yes. And when we say no, it's a no. And as difficult as it may be to keep that promise or to keep our word, we do it so that we can speak the truth in love. We need to speak the truth in love so that we can walk in personal integrity so that we mean what we say and say what we mean. Please understand that the Christian who comes to church and makes all sort of empty promises only to then turn around and break them because they really had no commitment to what they were saying, they're failing to do their part to cause the spiritual growth of this body of believers. The believer who comes to a church and and says yes to a ministry opportunity and then turns around and says no because they really didn't think it through. It got tough. It got hard. I just couldn't. They're simultaneously damaging the unity of the church through a lack of personal integrity. That being the case, I want to conclude our study by encouraging every believer here today to become Christians who are creating a good testimony by walking in personal integrity. And in order to do so, we must understand that the integrity of our testimony, it's based on our credibility. And what this means is that Christians should be people who are reliable and dependable, especially as it pertains to the promises that we make to one another. Not only that, but the integrity of our testimony is based upon our honesty. Therefore, we should make sure to keep the oaths that we've made so that others can trust that our word is truly our bond. And finally, the integrity of our testimony is based upon our fidelity. Therefore, let's adhere our lives to the promises that we've made so that our yes means yes and our no means no. And as we continue to walk in the credibility and the honesty and the fidelity of Christian integrity, our testimony will become like a beacon of light. And it will point people to the love of the Lord. And so with that, I encourage you. Let's walk in Christian integrity so that we can point people to our Savior, Jesus.